Let's conclude this lesson now with an overview of the four major parts of the microeconomics puzzle that you will be studying over the next few months. In lectures two through four, we'll take a very good look at how the forces of supply and demand reach an equilibrium in the product market, the market for consumer goods like autos and shoes and computers. This figure shows just such an equilibrium. Note that the price of the good, in this case cornflakes, is on the vertical axis and the quantity of the cornflakes is on the horizontal axis. Note also that the demand curve slopes downward. This reflects the idea that the lower the price, the more cornflakes that consumers will want to buy. Similarly, the supply curve slopes upward, indicating that as prices rise, businesses will be willing to provide more cornflakes. The powerful idea behind this figure is that the price in the market will tend to be set where the supply and demand curves cross. In order to understand exactly why this equilibrium happens, we're going to spend a lot of time in the first part of our studies understanding each of the components of these curves. To understand the downward slope and shape of the demand curve, and indeed why that curve may also shift, we'll spend a whole lesson on the theory of consumer and household behavior. By the same token, to figure out why the supply curve slopes upward, we'll look at so-called production theory which examines why firms price and produce products the way they do. Once we come to understand these demand and supply curves, it will become very apparent why prices tend towards an equilibrium where the two curves cross. In lectures 5, 6, and 7, we will turn to the broader issue of how markets are organized and structured. In this stage, we'll see that when a market meets Adam Smith's test of being perfectly competitive, its invisible hand truly is a wondrous mechanism. It allocates resources in the most efficient way possible without any help or interference of the government. However, in this part of our studies, we'll also come to understand that markets are prone to various kinds of market failures that may require the government to intervene to correct these failures. The three most important market failures involve imperfect competition, such as monopolies, externalities, such as pollution, and public goods, such as national defense. In each case, the market failure leads to inefficient production or consumption, and government can play a useful role in solving or reducing the problem. For example, when there is only one seller in the marketplace, a monopoly, that seller tends to set prices too high and consumption is too low relative to the most efficient outcome that would occur in a market with numerous buyers and sellers. In such a case, government intervention into the market may be appropriate, and such intervention may involve regulating prices and profits or prohibiting actions such as price fixing. A second type of market failure involves negative externalities and positive externalities. In the case of a negative externality, a company may produce steel and sell it for the market price. In manufacturing the steel, the company will incur costs for its machinery and raw materials and labor, and those direct costs to the firm will be subtracted from its revenues to calculate its profits. However, in a free market, what the company does not take into consideration are the broader external costs it may impose on society in the process of making the steel. Such costs arise, for example, when the company pollutes the river adjacent to its plant or the air basin over the nearby town. We'll learn that in the presence of negative externalities, like pollution and congestion, the free market produces too much of the good, steel in this example, at too low a price. In such a case, the government may want to regulate or tax the polluters, while in the presence of positive externalities, associated with goods like education and vaccinations, government subsidies may be appropriate to internalize the externality. Still a third market failure involves so-called public goods like national defense and lighthouses. The problem with public goods is that they are non-rival in consumption, meaning that my use of, say, a lighthouse doesn't interfere with your use of that same lighthouse. 
This is very different from goods that are rival in consumption, like hamburgers and shoes. If I eat the burger or wear the shoes, you can't. As we shall see, the typical solution to the public goods problem is for the government to step in and provide it. That's why it is the government that is in charge of providing many public goods, from national defense in the criminal justice system to parks, roads, and bridges. The crucial importance of the concept of market failure is that it helps us better understand the many reasons, good and bad, why the government may get involved in our businesses and our lives. And it is especially important for people in business to understand the economic role of government because government rules and regulations have as much or more to do with the bottom line profits of most companies than any competitor's actions.